recording now. Yeah. Yeah, we're recording now. Good. Let's not forget <laughs> to record. As I was saying, we're going to have a recording of this event on our website. And Yari was kind enough to prepare an actual guide, which we're also going to post really soon. It's not quite up there, but we'll be posting it really soon so you can learn much more about the birds of the hillside. So Yari is a relatively new member. Matter, matter of fact, she's a almost a brand new member of uh, El Cerrito. She's a longtime birder. She really wants to get more involved with the community and hopefully with uh, trekkers. You know, trekkers over the years, well, you know, we've gotten to know a lot of people and people have got to know each other through us. And I think we've done a good job of doing good things and we want to keep on doing it. And I can't think of anything else to say. So, oh yeah, just one other thing. We had a program yesterday that was really quite good about, um, it was a virtual broom pull about how to remove broom. And you should watch it because it really, it's not quite posted yet, but it will be. Um, I, I learned a great deal about the noxious broom plant that made me dislike it even more than I already do. Okay, so at that point, let's turn it over to our speaker, Yari Greeny. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet a lot of you. Uh, thank you so much, Dave, for uh, allowing me to join in your festival this year. I'm very excited to get more involved um, and to get to share my love of birding with my neighbors in El Cerrito. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with a land acknowledgement. So I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly. Um, and so we in El Cerrito and everywhere in the Bay Area live on Lishan Ohlone land. The Lishan people have lived in this territory since the beginning of time. For, for thousands of years, hundreds of generations, the Lishan Ohlone people have lived on the land that is now known as the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. They did not own the land, they belonged to it. Generation after generation, they cultivated reciprocal relationships with the plants and animals and shared this place with and developed beautiful and powerful cultural practices to keep in balance. This is a map of the, the tribes that live in this area. They have survived over two centuries of genocide and colonization during the Spanish, Mexican, and American eras. And today we continue to inhabit, they continue to inhabit their ancestral homeland. I want to encourage everyone to visit this website. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, they do invite folks who are non-Indigenous to pay a Shumi land tax. The Shumi land tax it's a voluntary annual contribution that non-Indigenous people uh, pay uh, who live on traditional Ohlone territory to support the work of the Segoriate Land Trust, which is an Ohlone-led group. Um, and the, the, so the Shumi land tax directly supports Segoriate's work of rematriation, which means returning Indigenous land to Indigenous people. They are working to establish a cemetery to reinter stolen Ohlone ancestral remains. They built urban gardens, community centers, and ceremonial spaces. So current and future generations of indigenous people can thrive in the Bay Area. Shumi means gift in the Ohlone language. So I'm going to go ahead and just drop this link in the chat and, and do encourage folks to go learn more about the land that we live on here this Lishan Ohlone land. And if you can, I encourage you to consider paying Shumi. Um, if, you, if you do end up deciding to pay, it would be great if you could fill out this form, which I'll also drop in the chat. And that will help us work together as a community to hold each other accountable and continue our learning about this indigenous land that we live on. Um, and then without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and launch right into our, um, our presentation for today. So to give you a little bit more background about me, uh, my dad is a birder. I grew up birding, grew up not really loving birding <laughs> because as those of you who have spent a lot of time with birders know, it's hard to carry out a conversation with a birder because they're always looking up and looking away in the middle of a conversation. Um, so didn't always love it, but really came to, and I find that birding is just a really wonderful way to get to really pay more attention to the world around us and notice things, notice how the seasons change, um, and how this whole world interacts around us. So 
it's been really wonderful for me because of that. And El Cerrito is a really awesome place to bird. In addition to the hillside area, we're surrounded by wetlands and just a huge range of biodiversity. So very lucky to live here. Um, very happy to be um, getting to talk about birding with all of you. I'm going to share a short video which I made specifically for um, the Hillside Festival. So it's going to be pretty silly. It includes me at the Hillside Festival or at the Hillside Natural Area pointing out different locations of birds. So first we'll go ahead and watch that and then we'll go through the guide that I created together um, and talk more in depth about some of the birds you can see, some tips for using binoculars uh, and where exactly in the Hillside Natural Area it makes sense to go. So if you are just joining, uh, please feel to drop in the chat your name, pronouns, and how experienced you feel you are at birding so I can kind of get a sense. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can share this video. I think the sound should work, but if it doesn't, if someone could message me and just let me know that you can't, if you can't hear it, um, and then I will troubleshoot. Okay, so here is the screen. Okay, you should be able to hear sound right away. So if you can't, someone please message me and I hope you enjoy. Toeys are a type of sparrow. You can find them on the ground and they'll usually be scratching around in the dirt as they look for bugs. So knowing where to stop and look for birds can be a really good skill. I stopped here because there's all of this brush, these kind of low growing scrubby plants growing up along the fence. And when I stopped, again, just using my eyes, not my binoculars to look for motion, I saw a little wren hopping around on the edge. So whenever you see a huge clump of brush like this, you know you might get some of those little birds like wrens or sparrows kind of hopping down low among the branches. are small birds that you'll see flying around really high or sometimes near the ground and they fly in really crazy patterns all over the place. They very rarely land.
Sometimes looking for birds can be really tiring, especially when they're really little and they're high up in the tree or hiding in the branches. But the great thing is that there are birds all around us and we don't have to use our eyes all the time. Sometimes we can use our ears. So right now, I'm just gonna close my eyes and try to count as many different bird calls as I can. And sometimes you might not hear the call. Maybe you'll hear their beating wings. Maybe you'll hear a hummingbird that whizzes past you. And you don't have to know exactly what the birds are. Just knowing that there's a lot of different calls can be a really rewarding experience. Lizard. That's okay. I like lizards too. Red tail hawks really like it here. It's a classic red tail hawk screech. What was that? I think I just saw a hummingbird. I think I saw some movement up here. It might have been a bush tit or maybe a kinglet. Not really sure. But if I just stand here, I'm looking up at a lot of branches. So sometimes to get a better view, you actually need to back up. So I'm just going to walk back a few yards. And then I can turn around and see more of the tree. And I also have a better angle on my neck. The views at Hillside Natural Area are so awesome. And the great thing about taking a pause to look at the views is that you can also use it as a time to take a pause to look for birds. So behind me, I have some red-tailed hawks flying. We saw some turkey vultures soaring far in the distance over there. Sometimes birding is just about patience. So maybe just take a break, listen, and see what you see while you're enjoying the views. birding in eucalyptus forests like this one with the eucalyptus trees is actually pretty tricky because the birds will be really tiny and they'll be really far up. So when I'm first starting birding, I actually prefer the oak trees or the shorter scrub um, so that I can find birds more easily. But a eucalyptus grove is a great place to stop and take a rest in the shade. Another reason that it can be really hard to find birds in the eucalyptus trees is that eucalyptus are non-native. They're actually invasive species and so we don't get a lot of our insect communities and our bugs that are native to California. They don't like these trees very much and they stay away from them and that means there's less food for the birds. So oftentimes I've found that it can be harder to find birds in the eucalyptus trees. <laughs> right now this dry creek bed part of the hillside natural area has just become my favorite part we've just been standing here for the last 10 or 15 minutes and we've seen so many bird species so i really encourage you to just come here chill out in the shade use your ears and see what you can see we saw a nest of a raptor up in those eucalyptus you might be able to spot it it's just in one of the v's of the eucalyptus so take a look see if you can find that nest it's been used by raptors this very spring um
Uh, we also saw three species of warblers, which is so exciting to me. Uh, warblers can be kind of tricky to spot if you're new to birding because they're really small and they flit around a lot. Um, so they can be hard to catch with your binoculars. But if you're a little bit more advanced of a birder, things to look out for that I saw today were a Wilson's warbler. They're bright yellow with a little black cap. <laughs> Then we saw an orange crowned warbler, which is yellow with an orange crown. And today he even bowed his head so we could see his orange crown. And we also saw a black throated gray warbler. And these are really delicate little birds hopping usually pretty high in these trees. Another really exciting thing we saw today, my first one of this spring, was a black-headed grosbeak. And they have huge beaks, so look for a big bulky beak and a big black head. So they have a whole black hood and they're really a beautiful orange on their belly. So if you see that, that's going to be a black-headed grosbeak. Another exciting thing we saw was two robins just hopping along this path. You might even be able to see those in your neighborhood sometime. They have really bright orange stomachs and they, um, they're really kind of funny birds that will come out and be curious to see you. We saw a couple of California towhees, which are brown birds that usually like to hop along the ground. You might even see them crossing the trail, just kind of hopping as they go. And if you pay careful attention, you'll see that underneath their tails, they have a bright orange splotch. And that's how you can always tell that they're a California towhee. Let's see, we also saw some chickadees, which are super cute, squeaky little birds with uh, black heads and brown on the sides of their wings. And they like to cling onto branches and hop around the branches. So if you see a really cute little bird with a black head, that's a chickadee. <laughs> Stellar's jays. We saw Stellar's jays. I love Stellar's jays. So Stellar's jays have pointy, pointy hats. They're a beautiful dark blue bird and they have a really obnoxious loud squawk. So if you see a lot of movement, they're crashing through. They've got those pointy heads. That's how you know you saw a Stellar's That you coming that you come to this part of the trail hang out in the shade near this dry creek bed and just enjoy the sounds and sights of the birds of the hillside natural area this goal here is also a really good place to just stop and enjoy the shade and for birds again. We saw more Wilson's warblers here, so good spot to look for those tiny little birds flitting around. More chickadees, you can hear the Stellar's Jay behind me. So anytime that you have all of this vegetation and these gullies that are kind of headed down the hillside, that kind of break up like the sunny, more barren areas, that's a good clue that you might just want to take a stop and look for some birds. lots of scrub, lots of trees. Here we've even got some redwoods. So you might be getting some different birds here than you would in different areas. Uh, we just saw a hermit thrush here, which are really beautiful birds. So.
All right. Thanks, everyone, <laughs> for bearing with me and watching that. Um, had a lot of fun making it. And it is definitely true that the hillside is just a gift for all of us. It's a really um, great place to explore. I, I went through a number of birds that we happened to see that day. Um, I did this a few weeks ago, so now we might even be getting some more spring birds, hopefully some orioles and tanagers coming in there. Um, I'm going to now share with you all uh, a bird guide, which is just a little PDF. Um, I'll share it on my screen, but I'm also going to give it to everyone here so you have it. And as Dave said, it will be posted on the website after. Um, the idea with this guide, here, let me just share my screen, is um, one, to give you a sense of some resources for uh, looking for birds in the hillside natural area, and also, um, you know, how to use binoculars. Sounds like many of you have used binoculars before, so that's good. <laughs> um, if you haven't used binoculars, highly recommend using them in order to um, really be able to get the full benefit of, of doing that. Uh, before we jump into this, does anyone have any questions from the video or things that have come up? No questions. Okay. Can everyone still hear me correctly? Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So the birds of El Cerrito Hillside Natural Area, this guide I just shared with you, um, reminder that we are on indigenous land. And again, I encourage folks to consider paying shumi. Binocular tips, if you're ever trying to take a new birder out, please try to find them an extra pair of binoculars or lend them yours. I've had so many people say, oh, I'm not really into birding, but they never actually birded with binoculars. So they're just like squinting at little dots in the distance. Uh, it's really not the same experience. Um, I really encourage you to use them. For this month only special announcement, I was able to borrow a whole bunch of binoculars that I'm happy to lend out to folks if they wanna borrow them for a couple of hours while they go explore uh, the Hillside Natural Area or somewhere else in El Cerrito. So if you would like to borrow binoculars in order to do that, or if you know someone who you'd love to take out birding but really wish they had binoculars, please just shoot me an email. Uh, I'm at yaregreeny at gmail.com. It's here in the guide and here is also um, this. Yes, I realize I'm not in presenter view. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so that, you know, please don't let binoculars be a, a barrier to you. And then the other thing is make sure that the binoculars are actually working for you. A lot of people have told me, oh, you know, my eyes just don't work with binoculars. That's not true. It's just that the binoculars need to be adjusted to fit your face. If you're seeing a bunch of black dots or the, you know, you feel like most of your view is covered, it just means that the binoculars need to be adjusted. They move in a lot of different ways. So you can kind of squish them apart closer together to make sure that the distance is correct. Um, make sure that you twist the eye cups out toward your face unless you wear glasses. Uh, and then definitely practice, right? It's it's an art that I'm still working on myself, you know, trying to actually hold your eye in place while bringing binoculars up to your face is a skill that is developed over time. So don't feel bad if the first time you go out birding or even the 10th time you go out birding, you're having trouble getting the view of the birds through the binoculars. Uh, it's definitely a skill that you can protect or perfect over time. The last tip I'll give is that it's good to look for motion, and you you probably noticed me talking about this in the video as well. Instead of looking for something that looks like a bird, like a bird shape, it can be helpful to actually just look for motion, right? If you see a leaf moving um, in like a kind of a strange way, maybe you see the flicking of a, a, of a wing somewhere, you should actually focus your eyes on that and glance all around just looking for that motion. And then once your eye is trained on the area with motion, that's when you hold your eye muscles still and bring the binoculars up to your face. Um, and that's really the, the most effective way, I think, to do it. Um, OK, so it's a bit about binoculars. This was in the video, um, the best birding spots, at least, you know, at least for me for that day and maybe a different day, it would be something else. But I really just love those gullies 
um, where, you know, it's a dry creek bed and there's just so much vegetation. It's also a nice place to stand for 10 or 15 minutes and just look for birds quietly because uh, it's nice and shaded there. So this roughly marks where, <laughs> where I think is some of the best places. And you could see we saw probably 20 species just standing at that one spot, some really high quality species too. And this is, you know, I'm sure people are pretty familiar, but this is starting at the recycling center and just doing that little loop there. Very nice walk. As I mentioned, it's those shaded dry creek bed areas um, that I had the most luck, uh, at least that day. But really, it's going to be anywhere where you're going to feel comfortable being patient and just waiting for those birds to come out. Okay, so I put together a list of some of the birds to watch for at El Cerrito Hillside Natural Area. Uh, so, you know, this list is here for you. It's got some pictures that I think are pretty representative of what you'll see, um, as well as just a, a very brief, very informal description of what each of these birds are. But I will say if you're interested in getting a, a better sense of what birds are where and how often you can see them, you have to you have to use eBird. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's someone saying that the frame is still on the binoculars page. I meant to be walking through this. Let's see. Maybe if I just go back to non-presenter view. All right, at least we can walk through this together. So um, the, the birding resource that I think every birder should use is uh, eBird. And so if you go to eBird, you'll be able to use the, um, uh, actually, I'm going to have to share my screen differently if I want to show you this. So I'll do that in just a second. eBird is an online resource. I'm sure if you've done birding before, you're aware of it. And it will show you all of the common species in your in your area. And you can see what's been seen recently. It's absolutely key, I think, for beginning birders and advanced birders alike. Uh, and it's also just really fun to get to see what people in your community are seeing. Uh, and it can help you study for those birds that you might want to be aware of. Merlin Bird is an app that is super helpful for identifying birds. If you are looking to buy a bird book, which is also really good and good for studying, good for getting more details when you have a tough identification you can't figure out, I recommend Sibley Birds West. And then binoculars. People often ask me for binoculars. I recommend Celestron Nature. Um, they're really good quality without breaking the bank. And um, they're waterproof. I really love mine. Um, but again, if, if you're not looking to buy and you just want to borrow them for a while, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to lend some out to you. I made a quick bird bingo for folks. So this, you know, is especially if you're going out for um, with people who haven't birded before or if you hadn't birded before. Bird bingo is a really great way to start paying attention to the details that you'll need to become a successful birder. So instead of IDing a bunch of birds, maybe you just start noticing different behaviors, different colors. So, you know, you play it just like you would bingo. And anytime you see or hear one of these things, you just mark it off and you try to get five in a row or even try to get the whole bird, the whole board, not the whole bird. Um, and this is, I made three different board so you can play with three people. You can obviously rearrange it to make your own as well. Um, and let me just see if there's any that are kind of tricky. Singing and calling can be a little tricky. So whatever you decide sounds like a song, you can consider a song. Birds have different reasons for vocalizing. Sometimes when they're singing, they're claiming their territory, they're showing it's their home or it's their mate. Uh, if they're calling, they might be trying to communicate something like danger. Um, some of these are easier to understand. Fly catching. If you see a bird that's sitting on a branch and then flies out, grabs a bug, comes back to its same branch, that's fly catching. So they'll often make really cool um, designs in the air with their flight. Flying in a flock obviously means flying with a bunch of other birds and preening, they might be using their beak to kind of clean their wings. Okay, I wanna show everyone eBird really briefly, but are there any other questions before we do that? 
Great. Okay, I'm gonna show eBird and then that will be that. Feel free to keep dropping any questions or comments in the chat too, really enjoying that. Okay, so this is the bar chart on eBird for Hillside Natural Area. So this combines all of the eBird list, the, all of the birders who have visited this area in the last very long period of time have, have seen these different birds. And so over time, this data is so great because what it means for me is that I can go through and I can say, okay, it's May. Let me go down this list. These are all the birds that I could see, but these bar charts will tell me how likely it is to see at different parts of the month. So if I'm going down through May, we see, oh, morning doves. I'm probably gonna see a morning dove. That's great. Probably gonna see an Anna's hummingbird. I might see an Allen's, right? And then I might click the Allen's hummingbird so that I can study up to make sure, okay, do I remember how to identify an Allen's hummingbird? If I see that, what will I look for? And so this is just an absolutely invaluable tool. Usually before we go out birding, my partner will make a list of all of the birds that we could see, you know, maybe we haven't seen them recently and we should be excited to see them. Um, so really can't say enough good things about eBird. If you haven't explored it, you should definitely um, click around. There's just, there's endless resources. You can explore maps, you can explore hotspots all around the Bay Area. There's so many good birding spots here. So if you just zoom in, you'll be able to click on one and you can see those bar charts and that list for anywhere that you want to go. So really recommend if you haven't done that, that you do it. It's also an app. So you would be able to um, put it on your phone and also track the birds that you see there. Okay, and I will stop there for now. Uh, so Chris has asked, how much difference does the time of day matter for seeing birds in the natural area? What a great question. So I have heard a lot of people always tell me morning is best, the birds are waking up and they're hungry, the sun is there, so they're gonna go um, be active, be out and get the food. Um, I have found that's not really a huge impact on my birding success. I do find that it varies from day to day. Sometimes windier days are a little tougher. They might be hunkered down. Uh, if there's going to be rain or bad weather, they might be hiding a little bit more. But, you know, I would say don't worry about it. If it's the afternoon and you go out, you're still going to see tons of great birds. Um, the one thing is that they will get a little bit shy of people, especially some of the species that like to be a bit more hidden. So if you're going out at a really crowded time of day, then that's probably gonna have more of an impact on your birding success. Um, someone else asked, what was the last bird on the, the video? A hermit thrush, yes. And the hermit thrushes make those really alien calls. Um, I, it's just such a pleasure to be able to hear them and you will get them usually, not always, but often they're more on the ground um, and more in those forested areas. Thanks for those questions, guys. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, Yari, I have a question about how does the hillside area compare to other spots like Albany Hill or Tilden or some of the hills in Marin? Yeah, totally. That's a good question. I would say um, like pound for, pound for pound, size for size. It's really great. And I think that had a lot to do with the, the sort of varied vegetation, right? We've got a lot of natural vegetation. Um, a lot of different um, types of trees and types of uh, landscapes, right? So when I was out on, you know, where you have those really good views, that's a really good place to look for raptors that are soaring around and you get those really awesome views. And then when you get those shaded areas, it's really helpful to get more of those forest birds, especially when you have sort of a, a concentration like that, right? There were only a few spaces in the entire hillside area where a lot of those forest birds could go which for me as a birder is kind of fun because that means they're probably all going to be there uh, and they're easier easier to see for that reason. But I mean, obviously we just live in a really magical place for birders. <laughs> no matter which direction you go, you're gonna find good stuff. But uh, I, I was actually shocked 
at how many species I was able to see so readily at Hillside Natural Area. We've got another question about the seasonality and migration schedules, greater variety in January, February than we have lately. Absolutely, and that's another good reason that eBird is so helpful, um, is you can kind of see when you're gonna see more species. But the fun thing is that it's different species throughout the year. So even if you, know, you might see slightly fewer in one month than another, you're still gonna be seeing different birds than you would in January. So I'm still motivated, you know, even though I went there in May, I want to go next month too, because I'm going to be seeing a new set of birds. And that turnover is going to be pretty constant throughout the year in a habitat like this. So it's pretty special. Great questions. Any other questions? Well, okay, I think this has been one of our uh, livelier presentations. And <laughs> Thank you all for uh, coming. Now, Yari, that was just great. Um, and lending out binoculars, that's something. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. And yeah, please, please do consider um, reaching out to me if you would like to borrow binoculars for a while. Happy to provide those to folks. Actually, I do have one more question. Do you have Please. a favorite bird? Oh, I do get asked this so much. You know, I really love um, spotted sandpipers which are, they're, they're down more in the wetland areas and they hop around and are constantly bobbing their tails. So it's like, they're just like kind of dancing by themselves, wagging their tails around to show the world that they're healthy and ready to dance. So that's gotta be my favorite. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Hope you all enjoyed the, the presentation. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.